Hello, everybody, and welcome to another edition of the One Step Better podcast. I am Mike Schaefer, and with me this afternoon or morning, depending upon when you listen to this thing, is Shelby Betts. Shelby, uh, you've heard her, heard her here before multiple yeah. times. Shelby leads our sales team and uh, does a great job doing that. And uh, everybody else said uh, that they didn't want to be up here with me today. And so Shelby drew uh, the short end of the stick. Stuck in. That's how it happens, right? I'm stuck with you and all of our clients that sell women's products. <laughs> <laughs> Shout out to Susan. <laughs> That's true. That's true. That's a couple of podcasts ago. That's right. Um, so Shelby, thank you for taking the time out of your day. I know that you're a super busy person and you got plenty of other things that you'd rather do than sit up here and talk about who knows what for, <laughs> for 30 minutes or so. So it's going to be fun. Um, but before we get into the topic of the day, we got to start out something a little bit more fun. Also, by the way, um, whenever you did host the podcast with, uh, with Susan, Susan Tanner, mm-hmm. um, Pink Ribbons, I don't think you started with a fun question. I didn't. I We so, went right into it. I thought yeah. about asking her one and realized people are probably more interested in what she actually does. <laughs> I got some feedback from that. Oh, yeah? That, hey, we need a fun question. Oh, so, I love it. Okay. For next time, you got to have you got to have a fun question. Oh, darn, I have to do a better job <laughs> right. of That's gaining right. our audience. <laughs> audience, send in your questions the you want to answer. people have spoken. <laughs> yeah. That's what we should do. Send in the crazy questions. That'll yeah, be yeah. Not only the serious things, but send in the funny questions, too. What do you want to know about What this? do you want to know? We are really interesting people. So, <laughs> Sometimes we're too much of an open book. I think. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So here's the question of the week. Um, this is going to drop on November 10th, which is a couple weeks before Thanksgiving. Woo-hoo. If you are anything like my house, come Thanksgiving time, stuff starts to just get put into the refrigerator and we're preparing to cook and have the big feast. So the question is, what is the weirdest thing that can be found in your refrigerator? Oh, that one's tough. Um, we were talking about this offline, and I do have to at least say it. Becky, our producer, was uh, she's telling us that her mom still has her it's prom uh, corsage, her her corsage from prom still in the fridge. Which wow, what a woman! <laughs> That's crazy. <laughs> Sentimental man. I love that. I don't have anything weird in my fridge. Um, I have a couple of like, you know, spices that like sauces that I probably use. There's like a balsamic glaze from Costco that's like always in my fridge. And there's probably like three or four bottles in there. That's not super weird, but that's in my fridge. I'm a pretty Pretty generic cooker. Yeah. Yeah, (laughs) Yeah. So I don't know. I don't have anything crazy in there. What's the weirdest thing that you guys are most non-traditional thing, Mm -hmm. if there is? that you guys eat during Thanksgiving time? Well, we, I mean, everybody eats sweet potatoes. At least if they don't, they should eat sweet potatoes um, for Thanksgiving. But we do Jack Daniel's sweet potato casserole. All right. Which um, the original recipe calls for a cup of Jack Daniel's whiskey. And I would not recommend putting in a cup because it doesn't really bake out. I will not share the story about the Thanksgiving where I put a cup of Jack Daniel's and sweet potatoes. But um, I would recommend a quarter. Quarter cup. That's kind of kind of knock it down a little bit. Yeah, but no, we do sweet potato casserole, but it is always different because the whole family was lit up. And well, just you know, my grandma really liked those the sweet potatoes. <laughs> that was her favorite Thanksgiving so, ever. It was. Yeah, she's like, when are you bringing that casserole back? I thought she's never drank alcohol in her life, and I've ruined something <laughs> for her. So yeah, I think that's a little bit odd. Everyone has like a recipe for sweet potatoes, but we always we liquor them up a little bit, and they it gives that's it a so really funny. good flavor. So. All of the things that I would say are weird in my refrigerator are mm. things that other people would say is not weird. Like? Um, like sour cream. What? <laughs> I hate sour cream. <laughs> and my wife does, uh, she has like, makes sour cream ranch or makes ranch dip out of sour cream. Of course. And, and you probably know exactly what She's a good about. woman. But she'll do that. And she like puts the date on it and, you know, she labels it like, all right, this is not sour cream. Yeah. But that's just weird. I don't like that type of stuff. Oh, Normal yeah. condiments. Um, yeah, because you're not a ketchup guy, mayonnaise, right? You don't like any I condiments. I just like basic food. Mm. I don't need, I don't, I mean, yeah. I just want basic food. Okay, okay. I don't want to get too too fancy with my food. We do every once in a while have some weird cheeses that'll come up from, Oh yeah. we're just going to try a different recipe or something like that. Um, I do have a bunch of cheeses in my fridge. There's like a, the little basket at Kroger, they'll have like, have you ever been to the cheese aisle and there's like a little basket and you can get samples? Yeah. They're only like four bucks. I do those quite a bit. So those are like the leftovers from 
everybody that actually bought the. Rest what of I want to know block. is who out there buys a full block of something? Like, a, do you actually buy a full block Parmesan cheese? Because no. However, I would love to buy the full wheel <laughs> See how long of, of cheese <laughs> just <laughs> because. Yeah. I looked into it one time. Turned yeah. that stuff is not cheap. How like much? To buy, it was. I don't remember, but it was multiple thousands of dollars to get the full wheel of, wow. of cheese. Seriously? Yeah, yeah. And so, it, like at that point, it's like I don't, you know, it's crazy. <laughs> but okay, how cool would it be if you just had a giant block or a giant wheel of cheese, of cheese that's just sitting on your counter? Well, and I wonder when the expiry. Like, how good are they? They've got to be solid for a long time. I mean, how often does someone go through that big block of cheese? It would be my lifetime. It would be the last <laughs> cheese I ever buy. Yeah, no. And we use a lot of Parmesan cheese. My we kids eat Parmesan on everything. We do too. It may be worth getting like even just a half a, I don't know, a quarter block. Yeah. No so idea. Maybe you need to look into it. So cheese and analysis. sour cream though, those are the weirdest things in your fridge. It probably is. I mean, and at Thanksgiving? Have, uh, we don't do anything crazy. Um, I mean, again, like in my world, crazy is turkey on Thanksgiving. <laughs> I don't like turkey and we have turkey on Thanksgiving. Everybody's like, well, duh, you have turkey on Thanksgiving. Yeah. And so my definition of weird food is very different than everybody else's. So I find <laughs> not the right person to ask there. Uh, you know, we have normal Thanksgiving food. We don't, you know, we have turkey and we'll have ham and yeah. all the normal casseroles. A lot of beige and white uh, casserole dishes. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's exactly right. Yeah. Exactly right. So anyway, um, if you guys are listening out there and you have some weird things in your refrigerator, we would love to hear about it. Yeah. If nothing else, just to try to top Becky having her corsage <laughs> or her mom having her corsage still her in the corsage, refrigerator. Yep. Um, and so send us those in to one step better at patrickaccounting.com. And we will uh, update everybody next week if we get anything super crazy or super weird. Yes, we will. Um, today, we're going to talk about, since we got Shelby up here, um, we always like to try to play to your strengths. Um, Shelby, like I mentioned earlier, and you've heard before, Shelby leads our sales team and is really responsible for making sure that all of our outbound and even inbound strategy to bring in new clients uh, is falling on her plate. And uh, so what we're going to talk about today is kind of the pros and cons, um, the good and the bad of either kind of, I'll say a spectrum of, sure. we want to make sure that we're diversified in the type of clients that we're reaching. But at the same time, sometimes it makes sense to really niche down and, and find a specific segment, whether that is an industry or, or type of client. And uh, so we're going to talk about kind of the good and bad of that and how we approach that here at Patrick Accounting and Works. And so Shelby, I know that you and your team um, oftentimes will do what I think of like little sprints of we are going to go after this segment, whether it's yeah. an industry or type of client, whatever it is. How do you guys de decide, all right, this is what we want to approach. This is the type of client that we want to, to go after. And how do you decide, all right, this is how long we're going to do that. What does that look like? Yeah, we went through a phase, honestly, just to be transparent about what our team did. I would be curious to know what other sales leaders have done during COVID, but um, we honestly sat down and said, Every single month, we are going to cultivate a list. Y'all have heard me say on a different podcast, we don't purchase lists. I think that is a dumb uh, decision, personally, to buy lists. Um, I think your sales team should be prepping that. No one knows your client profile better than your sales team. At least they should. Um, so this year, we spent a, a couple of weeks in January kind of detailing out um, 12 verticals. And, and when I say vertical, I mean a specific industry. So this is probably, this podcast episode is probably primarily for service-minded businesses because if you're selling products, you have probably one particular niche you sell to. But when you're a service provider, um, you can do services for so many types of businesses. And a part of the challenge is determining who you don't do business with. And so we spent a few weeks at the beginning of the year saying, okay, what are the potential industries or verticals that have specific pain points and challenges um, that we are uniquely suited to answer? Um, they may not know about us, may not even be in our city, but like industry specific pain points and problems that they have that we can really just you know, we can service really, really well. And so um, we developed 12 niches. And then over the course of every month, we profiled and, you know, built that list of the people in that specific industry we would reach out to, put them in an email cadence, and then did some strategic calling and emailing and following up and, you know, building out some specific marketing materials for that group. So uh, how you go about doing that is you sit down and ask the question, you know, what are the pains that you solve? Um, what type of businesses do you like? 
like going after. Often I don't think um, professionals really think through that, but if there's a vertical you just really love, like, and you could service it, you know, why not? Um, so I think it's just a combination of trying to decide who you want to serve, knowing exactly who you don't serve, and then part of it's just who do you really enjoy going after, and that's how you get there. Do you find that the more opportunities you have to go after a targeted audience that is more specific to industry where you are a little more in a niche market, the more that you do that, I find that you start to develop an expertise in that area, which is really important for both the sales team and the operations team that's actually be following through with the work. Sure. But the, the more that you do that in different industries and you start to replicate that model, then it allows you over time, you actually are becoming more diversified because in our area, we may say, you know, at this quarter, this month, this X, we're going to go after this target or this type, whatever it may be. And then the next quarter, the next X, we're going to go after that type and then do that enough times. You kind of have many segments of expertise, yeah. but you start to develop a broader base, which sure. is, I think, kind of our approach overall. Now, we have very targeted customers that we go mm -hmm. after um, because we don't think that we serve everybody well, and we want to make sure that we hit those, uh, hit the people that we do serve well more than anybody else. Uh, and, and that's helpful, but over time, do you ever find that that just kind of gets a little bit boring? Uh, kind of trying to specialize. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. So I kind of mentioned, you know, we did 12 this year and we honestly just got exhausted in the process because we're like, okay, we're going to put 300 people every single month in that. So keep in mind, this is not like, Hey, I've got a, a list that I can pull from a thousand, filter it down. And here's my list. It's, we were painstakingly finding those 300 people we wanted to put. And I was like, Holy moly, this is a lot of work for just, you know, something that's supposed to be pretty automated and easy for us to tap into. Um, but to answer your question, yeah, it does get a bit boring because once you do know some of the ins and outs of a specific industry and the pain points you can solve, it can be frustrating when you're speaking with someone and they just don't get it. So I feel like a lot of times when we when we work with particular prospects, we have a technology set and we're offering them processes and really like all of the tools that we you know help our clients utilize are tied into a specific process. And if the company is unwilling to adapt the process, not just the tech, um, we may not actually solve the problem. And so from my standpoint, that can be frustrating because when I can see, hey, this this particular business or this industry may be unwilling to adapt a process as well as a tech, it's no fun anymore because then it's, well, yeah, we can solve the problems, but they're not actually being solved, which is no fun because then, you know, then you're, you're not, um, you know, it just being misaligned. I think, uh, part of the reason service providers exist is to offer a service, but to be fulfilled by being able to be a valuable partner. So I think that can be boring. Um, but the other piece that's probably boring is just like, once you know it, you really know it. And then what, you know, what What's mountain next? is left to yeah. tackle. Yeah, I, that's, that's You probably feel that more in operations is my guess. I do. Um, but I, you know, I think it's true on both sides of the fence simply because I like to build, I don't like to maintain. Uh, and so whenever I feel like I've, I've kind of mastered something or to the point where I feel like I've mastered, maybe I haven't, but I feel like I, I have, I want to move to the next thing. What's, what's the next thing to create? And so it's difficult for me, like, you know, in, in your world, it would be hard for me to say, all right, this quarter, you know, depending upon length of time, we're going to go after this industry and try to find all the pain points and how we can match those things. It get I get tired of that over, you know, if I had, this is why I'm not in sales, right? The, the more <laughs> times I had that same conversation that you mentioned where it's, hey, you know what, that sounds great, but I'm just not really, or we recognize we're just not really a good fit because of X, Y, Z. I only like to hear that a couple of times. And then it's like, all right, this isn't working. Let's go to the next thing. <laughs> sure. I just, I get tired of it. And it's, it's, it, and it, then that starts to go back to, well, because in my brain, I'm thinking, all right, do we have uh, an ideal customer problem or did we not target this in the, in the right way? Or instead of just, you know what, sometimes it's going to take a whole bunch of no's or a whole bunch of, this isn't a great idea to get to the, you know, the one client that does. So maybe it's really just, I get bored with it because I'm not suited for the roles that you guys on your team <laughs> actually do. Maybe that's it. Maybe that's the awakening that we've had here. So getting back on track, uh, we've talked a bit about the pros of niching down, which in my mind is, um, you know, the repeatable side of the sales process and the operational servicing part. But what would you say some of the cons of niching down might be? 
you're bringing on risk anytime that you're looking at, you know, having one or two markets that you're serving. We saw this a lot with COVID. Um, you know, in, in our world, in our accounting services, we had 60 or so percent of our clients were in the hospitality space. And as soon as Trump is on TV, essentially saying that the world is shutting down, it was, you know, within a week, we had our entire team together talking through contingencies of what if, um, fully expecting that we were going to see a significant client drop just from companies going out of business uh, out of that. That started a lot of talks around what does it look like to diversify and, and bring on different industries or should we or shouldn't we? I think that's the biggest thing is the risk of you know, if something happens. We, we never thought that we would ever see uh, the day in which multiple you know, people, multiple, multiple companies in one single industry was hit as hard as it was. Now, thankfully, that turned out not to be, uh, you know, the, the risk there wasn't as, as large as we at first anticipated. But that, you know, I think that's a, a significant thing you have, to, you have to think through. I personally enjoy contingency planning. I like to think through worst case scenarios and, you know, what ifs and even outlandish like alien attacks. And this is what, you know, that type of stuff is probably not that crazy, but those types of things, I enjoy that. And so thinking through for our organization, all right, if we're going to go into this market or with this industry, what are some of the things that could impact that industry that would then have a flow through effect for our company? That's the big one that I think is, is you have to watch out for. Another one is you, it is easy to perceive yourself as an expert from the outside looking in, and you don't understand the finer points that are actually true issues in that organization. You mentioned that good salespeople are very inquisitive. I agree with that 100%. We, you have to be able to ask good questions and do some research to figure out which questions you need to ask. I've seen it you know, multiple times where we've had people who thought they knew and they would ask halfway decent questions and in and, and the conversation believed that they were experts. But the reality is they didn't quite understand. So when you present yourself as, hey, I'm the expert, I'm the leading person for this industry, and then you can't follow that up, you really lose a lot of credibility. And that's hard to come back from whenever, especially if you do that on a public scale, it's hard to come back from. And that entire industry that you think that you're an expert in is really kind of writing you off. And so um, you know, that you have to understand if, if you're going to go deep, you're gonna have to go deep and go really thing. deep. Yeah. I th think? And that needs to be a part of your strategy. If you're choosing on, okay, if you're looking at, Hey, I do want to have a segment that I am an industry expert in part of that um, discussion has to be um, the continuing education piece of, Hey, you know, I think COVID was just a prime example of that because, you know, in the tax world, so many programs came out so quickly and there's so many changes that were happening. And if you weren't staying abreast of reading all of that and knowing what was going on, you couldn't pivot and take that information that affected your industry and, you know, educate your client base on that. So I think that continuing education piece is something, if you choose to niche down, just know that a part of that is always going to require you to be learning constantly because the world is always changing and evolving. Yeah. I, you know, in an organization like ours, where we're a service-based business that is trying to equip small, small, mid-sized business leaders to run better operations, better organizations, better people management. We have to be very broad in our understanding of whole systems, but we have to be very deep in our understanding of specific systems. And whenever we're able to do that, it does present our, present our people, you know, your team specifically on the front end to be able to be people who can come in and, and as a true consultant. And I enjoy that about what we do and how we work. Because you, you and your team, they'll go to an organization that is interested in services and you don't just start and stop with, hey, I think we can help you. Let's you know, get a proposal together and sign up and get moving. You go into a deep dive to figure out, can we actually help you? And then use that information to help them understand where, you know, based on, hey, I've had this conversation with dozens of other businesses like in similar situations, Hey, have you thought about this? I enjoy that about what we do. And you can only do that if you have the time and resources to actually get deep within a specific industry or a specific market. Yeah. 
I think part of that too, just when you think through just like identifying your niches or identifying verticals you want to be experts in, a part of that is just scoping out your talent that exists on your team um, to know, do we have the people that are willing to like, you know, put energy towards this and to think creatively? Um, I always think, you know, there's time tested principles that always work. Customer service from a principle standpoint, if you teach the principles and your team can think, um, then in those situations where this is not always the same, or this requires a little bit more, you know, going deep diving, if they have the time tested principles, and they can then evaluate and, you know, wisely decide what the best course of action is, um, you equip your team. But I think part of the challenge is just knowing, finding the people and, and hiring the right people to, to have that kind of creative mindset and always ask questions and always be thinking about the next best and how is things change? How are things changing? If you don't have that on your team, it's, it's, hard to you know sell your services or your product in the marketplace people make all the difference in they the world. do yeah it, it makes a huge difference in in our company uh where you get to deal with somebody very i'll say intimately from the standpoint of we know what's going on in your operations when you work with us we know that pretty well both from having conversations with you but also having done it hundreds of times with you know like kind businesses and We've all been there where you pick up the phone and you call somebody and the person on the other line just doesn't get it. Whether it's they're new and you know not their own fault, they just haven't been around long enough or you know whatever it is. And it's just frustrating a lot of times to have to you know reiterate the same thing. People make all the difference in the world. So we, we talked about you know cons of, of niching down. I think that it's, it's also important to understand the, the more specific you get into a, a niche, um, with people sometimes can be, it's, it's a plus and minus. Sometimes it's easy to develop people because you've, you know, you have the experience to be able to do that over and over again. But if you are, if you do hire people that don't like, you know, repetitive tasks, it, that gets difficult. Um, also, I think you have to have a very clear ideal customer if you're going to start to niche down into different targets, because it gets to be very clear who you you know, you're essentially going after these, this target because you think that you can work with them really well. And if you're wrong on that, you spend a lot of resources to try to go after that. Yeah, it's, it's, it's difficult to then back out of. Yeah. And I, I do think, I mean, part of the, um, you know, part of the discovery from a sales standpoint of finding your niches is doing a little bit of test and error. That's honestly why we went after 12 this year. That was exhausting for our team to continue replicating month after month to, you know, go down that deep dive. And so this next year, we're going to do quarterly. So we're going to say, hey, we're going to have four instead of 12. It just makes it a little bit more digestible. Um, but you can throw all of these resources into acquiring a specific type of client, become the expert, and then you actually get it in the door and begin servicing and, you know, trying to do what you wanted to do, which was sell them and then service them extremely well. And then find out, you know, Hey, we can't repeat this process or the solutions they need or, you know, some customization that we don't want to do or can't do or don't have the resources to develop. And so that can be a challenge to, from the sales side, kind of front of house thinking, okay, here's the target. And then you actually get in the door and realize, Hey, this is a bad, this is a bad fit. Yeah. So that's a challenge. How do you identify, or you mentioned our next year, we're going to go after these four. How do you identify the different areas that you want to target? Well, um, I think the first thing is just having a good beat on emerging markets. And so thinking through, um, just how many businesses out there could we actually get, you know, um, I don't know the total target. I'm trying to think of the word <laughs> that you use, the targetable addressable market, total addressable market, I think is the word that's back from way down anyway. Um, like, you know, okay, if you say I want to niche down and I want to uh, service businesses that sell printers, well, how many businesses sell printers in the U.S.? Are those national? Or are those independent franchises? Are you, you know, are you really good in franchises or not, you know, independents? Thinking through all of that is, is important just to think of like, realistically, if I were to be the expert in this, how big how is the big actual is market? market? <laughs> um, I think another, there's three people in the entire country that I can win. Yeah. yeah. Two of the things that we look at, you know, particularly is from a competition standpoint, how saturated is the potential market? How big is the actual market? How many potential clients could we acquire if we did become experts? Uh, those are two big things. And then I think 
the third thing that we look at internally is outside of the we've talked about this on other episodes, but outside of the, you know, the vertical pain points we can solve uh, from a psychographic, what are the types of people, personalities that mesh really well with our team? Um, we can do that because we're smaller, larger companies can't, but we do have an advantage there. So it's interesting. Something we look at. So whenever it comes to the strategy that you have for next year for us, are the targets that you're going to be chasing, are those like, you know, hey, we have a couple of clients that are in these industries, in these spaces, and you're going to use those kind of case studies. How, how do you go about developing? All right, these are the four. I've chosen these four. What is your strategy to actually have? Now I'm going to go and saturate myself inside of those specific industries. Yeah, once you've done the research and you've determined it's a viable um you know, vertical or viable industry to pursue, um, your next plan is to build your assets to, to be relevant to that industry. Um, I have a, we have a product and service that we want to, you know, help people leverage. Um, but before I can convince you of buying my product or service, you have to know about who I am and you have to be a little bit intrigued by what we do. Um, so I think, you know, there's a ton of, of bad salespeople out there. And I say bad salespeople, but there's just a ton of very generic, basic, hey, would you be interested in a 15-minute discovery meeting? We offer a product. I know you already have that product, but, you know, eventually sometime this year, you're probably going to look at it. So a lot of our sales activities are usually just driven around, is their current provider messing up? You know, because if they are, then this is the right time. And so a lot of sales is timing. Um, but I think to be proactive, some of the things you look at is, hey, what would this industry really benefit from knowing that um, I could offer to them um, that is secondary to like my product and service? So we've mentioned, you know, client, um, excuse me, employee retention. You know, from our perspective, we know home health care really struggles with retention. And so rather than developing some, here's five things that you can do to, you know, retain your caregivers. Well, let's go back and address some of the systematic, you know, problems that exist that caregivers are leaving the market for. How can we help, you know, leaders and be educated around those and address those problems specifically? So um, I would say develop, you know, marketing assets um, to help you know, your industry, know who you are, attend their spaces. So be in their circles, know their network partners, the people that the verticals, sorry, the other strategic partners they work with. And then I think, um, lastly, you know, have an offering, um, that is genuinely there to educate, help, um, and guide a prospect long before they ever become your client. So it sounds like if you're doing all of those things, this is, this is a bigger initiative, than just a sales and marketing team. There is more education that has to happen beyond just your single department. Definitely. Yeah, your whole your whole organization has to be on board that, you know, because, okay, so your sales team is going to niche down. Know, they're going to know how to speak the language, the exact pain points and problems. Well, if your operations team has no idea, <laughs> this, you know, if they don't know, then what happens when that client comes in the door? So, yeah, it, it requires your whole leadership team and your whole, you know, all of your departments to really understand what that industry is going What's through. What's happening. That's a challenge. I'm just going to go with the, hey, yeah, you need to talk to Shelby about that. She, <laughs> she knows better than I do. That's going to be my go-to answer. That's yeah. interesting. So, you know, once you, once you kind of have those targets in mind and you have, you've developed your, your marketing assets and you're going after them, are you, do you guys you just here for us internally, are you guys just using boots on the ground, cold emails, cold, you know, phone calls? What, what is your actual strategy to set those first time appointments? Well, this I'm interested in uh, learning from other people who are listening to the podcast. Like, what are you guys doing? Um, we're doing a lot of things. Um, you know, we look at social channels where our buyers at today. They're not always in their email inboxes. You know, um, I just, I, Matt is a good example for me of this. You know, Matt uses a tool that is like filtering out people he directly knows, knows versus, you know, potential like spam emails or marketing emails. And so if I know my buyers are probably not looking at my emails and they're definitely not taking phone calls because they're probably remote, their office phone may not work anymore like how do you get in front of people so I think you have to really consider addressing 
you know, all aspects of your potential buyers. And so the first step is to know where they are and then go find those places. So that for us looks like uh, channel partners. So, you know, networking with people that they already do business with, um, becoming a resource for those people. And so that they top of mind when they're in conversations that they can, you know, say, hey, you should come work with this company. They understand you. Um, part of it is is cold outreach of this might be relevant. Part of it is inviting them to resources we're creating. Hey, here's a webinar. So why I think it makes sense for you to do this. We've actually developed this with you in mind. Um, and then offering those assets the best that you can. So it's a, it's a multi-pronged approach these days. You never know where prospects are going to be, which is a challenge. Yeah. How do you evaluate your success on, you know, because essentially we're talking about, hey, we're going to go after and really target this industry, this, this space. How do you look back and say, hey, you know what, that actually worked well. That one didn't work well. Do you have targets in mind? You know, if this is going to be successful. That means we're going to close 10 new deals. Or you know, how do you actually make sure that what you're doing is on target to to be successful. Yeah, well, you look at your metrics. Um, well, I'll just be transparent and list one that we did that was not successful. We really felt that dentists were going to be a good, we were just going to kill the heck out of the Memphis dentist market and then go beyond. And every channel we used from a social media standpoint, phone, email, LinkedIn, Facebook, Messenger, Twitter, Instagram, like no one responded. <laughs> The dentists out there, out there aren't just thinking, so, all right, how do I get back in touch with you? Yeah, so look at your metrics. I mean, yeah, start with your meetings and then start with your – well, you have to backtrack, right? It's how many clients did we actually acquire last year? If we actually pursued this vertical, um, and there's some trial and error there, but um, how many clients did we actually bring on in this industry? And so from a CRM standpoint, you have to be able to know your metrics there. Um, how much revenue did they bring in from a revenue products you know, mix standpoint – is this a profitable client? If it is, how many did we get? How many of those did we lose? Because then it's, hey, was it, you know, my sales team that didn't um, sell the deal appropriately? Or, you know, you can kind of look at that. You need to look at your total opportunities and then your, you know, your win rate. And then after that, you need to back into how many appointments were you able to set? Um, were you not able to set? Did they hold? Did they not hold? And then past that is your activity uh, metrics, which is how many people did you actually reach out to? How many touches did you have to use to get to that? person and then from there um, you know what's the velocity really is from time to that first touch that they responded to that first appointment to a closed one or a closed lost opportunity what's your time frame if your industry it's taking you three quarters to acquire a new client you have to, you know, decide, hey, from a revenue standpoint, does that make sense? Like, is this a long sell cycle that actually makes sense? Or, you know, should we be realistically closing business in 14 days? You know, there's a lot you yeah. have to decide there. That's where all the opportunity cost decisions come in. Because, yeah. you know, if I'm going to go after this target market and it takes me three months and the average deal is just the same as this non-targeted market mm -hmm. that takes me three weeks, it doesn't make a ton of sense for me to pour resources into something over here, that's going to take a lot longer to close a, a, just a normal deal than it is on the other side. Yeah. And that's a part of it. I think just as, you know, as you're a growing business, you really, at some point you got to give your sales team some leeway to really try that stuff. Just because test. You don't know until you've tried it. I feel very confident we will never call dentist again because we called, I, th I remember we did a uh, call blitz during the snowmageddon, like when the snow was down in Memphis. And I thought, you know what, all of these dental offices, their, you know, their direct lines are going to go straight to the owner because small, you know, we're targeting small local dentists. In my mind, I'm thinking my office is shut down. Eventually it's making its way to my phone, I assume. Um, I remember our whole team called. I myself I called 100. I talked to zero people on the <laughs> phone. I left 100 really awesome voicemails that no one responded to. Yeah. And so it's like, yeah, you know, give it up, move on. Yeah. <laughs> when you bat, you know, strike out every time, hey, it's time to move on. And, you know, the That's thing okay. I like about that, though, is that we had a a presupposition that, mm -hmm. hey, this may work. This could be a target for us. Let's spend a little bit of our resources to, to prove the concept of whether or not this is going to be good or bad. And the freedom that you guys have to do that, sure. I would imagine, is 
good from a an employee morale standpoint that you don't feel like hey you know what i'm being micromanaged and have to do this series of tasks but i could be a little bit more creative in my role especially if you're you know leading a sales team there is a sense of art to that there's a, a sense of creativity that has to come with that but it also allows us as a firm to explore new things uh, mm-hmm. because whenever we do get you know let's say if we had 10 dentists that popped up on our radar that were all interested in services it's going to force at some point it's going to it's going to force us as a as an entire firm to say are we are we set up appropriately you know yeah. we think we are but are we truly set up appropriately to service this client base the way that we would expect to the to the level that we expect to here and I, I like that part. I enjoy yeah. that part. I, well, and I to be transparent, one of the uh, the hugest pros that I see from niching is um, getting into those markets. Okay, so you get five of this client. They're all asking you for something that you've never done before. Cool. Sounds like you have a brand new product you get to offer to the market, yeah. if it makes sense. And so that can be really exciting. It's like when I start hearing the same problem over and over and again, and it's not in our wheelhouse or it's not a product or service offering we've you know offered before. In my mind, I'm thinking, wow, is this a potential, like, could we build Should this? We yeah. yeah. And that's where it gets exciting. I think from the operational standpoint is, wow, could, is there something we can build here um, that we can do better than, you know, other providers? So. Yeah. And it's fun to be on that R&D process. Sometimes that answer is yes. Sometimes that yeah. answer is no. But you do not know until you <laughs> until actually you try. try. Just mm-hmm. a hypothesis until you prove it wrong or right. Yeah. Which uh, absolutely, I think that this whole niche idea, this whole concept is is really, for us anyway, it's, it is a lot about the R and the D and to determine, yeah. hey, is this something that is aligned well with what we're doing? Is this something that needs to be offered uh, by the services? Does it fit into kind of our, our hedgehog, uh, to use the good to great uh, uh, analogy? Sure. In, in what we do. And, and that's just the fun part of, of trying and seeing what happens. So Absolutely. Shelby, I appreciate you taking the time out of your schedule to come and talk sure. to us a little bit about diversifying and niching down and all of the things and what's in your refrigerator, what's not in your refrigerator, <laughs> all the fun things that we got to talk about today. Yeah. So thank you very much. Sure. Thanks for having me. If you guys are out there listening, just like Shelby said, remember, she wants to hear from you. So if you have some sales techniques that you think works really well, or if you think that works really, really poorly, please reach out. Let us know. Let us continue the conversation with you. You can find us at One Step Better at PatrickAccounting.com or just leave us a comment on YouTube or Spotify, Apple Podcasts, wherever it is that you are hearing us and make sure that you click subscribe so that you don't ever miss another episode of the One Step Better podcast. Thank you guys for joining us and have a lovely afternoon. Thanks, guys.